Abaddon has split the Imperium in half, led to countless deaths, and could be blamed as the cause for the entire state of the universe right now. Tell me where you've heard that one before. Gilliman is dead. He dies. Flatlined on the floor. The galaxy as we know it is surrounded. Thank you for tuning in. I am Isander. And I am Coda. And today we continue the Warhammer binge with last place in our community poll and the most intensive research-wise, a snapshot of the current era. A snapshot of the current era. Yeah, today we go over all the chaos happening right now in 40k and how the hell we got here. But before that, do you want double the episodes from us, access to the community discord, monthly streams, and the various rewards we give out as we decimate our goals? Then go join in on the fun at patreon.com slash Isander and Coda, or click the link in the show notes or the description to get access to all the fun stuff and help us keep chasing this absolutely mental dream. We're now on the road to 500 patrons after just crushing. Just blowing our... through 100 and 250. And uh, if you're there for 250, big congratulations to you. If you were there for 100, even bigger congratulations to you. Uh, because you guys will be getting the limited edition patches. Right now, it's finding somebody who can make them well and um, make something that will last. Once all that is locked in, we will start shipping them out. Lastly, you guys are already awesome at this, but please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe with that little bell button. We're on a mission to hit 10k by the summer, which we are going to hit. But most importantly, you know this, I know this, but the machines that rule over us kind of don't. They want short form, quick hits, and don't really have a preference for slower paced, longer format stuff. The only way we keep making this is by you doing those three things, but I already know I don't need to ask because we have one of the best fastest growing legions on this entire website and i will die on that hill as for you audio listeners please keep leaving your feedback in those reviews it's been awesome to go through them all and make sure you subscribe to the auto download you guys are amazing too and you've been helping us improve the show whether you know it or not so thank you very much and now let's get into it today we'll be starting like i like to not in the beginning always the middle with you no it's it's the before the beginning Oh, this one's going to be the most... A bo- another before the beginning? This one's going to be the most discordant if you're looking at raw timeline. Like, this is what happens, and this is what happens, and this is what happens. And that's by design, because it's going to make more sense this way. Mm. It's to streamline it, because this is 30 plus books. It's a lot of books. That also goes without being said. There is some things that will not be mentioned, just for the sake of time. This is to give a broad strokes gist, mm-hmm. kind of. Um, just a, a, a kind of a map pointing you in the right direction. Just like... Not even a map pointing you in the right direction. It will. I'm very confident by the time this is finished, you will know everything you need to know about the current era. And then from there, you can dive deeper into anything I mention here for some cool stuff. Because Warhammer spends a lot of time on battles, which are cool... But if I were to mention everybody who dies in the next 30 books, that'd be four hours of names. We'd be reading the Iliad in the sections where it's just like, and this guy died, and this guy died, and this guy died. Exactly, exactly. Um, So the way we got here is because Warhammer had kind of stalled out. Not much was changing in the lore, save for this one little dweeb named Abaddon running around, constantly attacking the Imperium. And and failing, actually? A couple times? Twelve times. uh, Twelve times to be exact. Giving him a very, very lame feel. Abaddon had been billed as the next big bad of chaos. Say that Uh, five times fast. I know, right? He was their strongest champion, and at the time, there seemed to be a fear in massive changes because it's really easy to ruin something that's already good. It's very hard to make it better. So he could never really win too hard because at the end of the day, the status quo had to go back. Every time Abaddon gained some ground, he'd have to be repelled at the end of the day. You know, good guys win and all that jazz, sunshine and rainbows. Yeah, the bad guys are cooler, but the good guys win regardless. Exactly. Which is fine. But the last champion of chaos was Horus, who split the Imperium in half, led to countless deaths, and could be blamed as a cause for the entire state of the universe right now. Mm. That's a... That's a... That's a... Some big shoes to fill right there. Exactly. With shoes that big to fill, a few wins here and there are just never going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. It's not going to amount to all that. (laughs) No. That was until lucky number 13, the 13th Black Crusade. To make him bigger and badder, they revealed that the first 12 weren't abject failures, like it first looked, but rather bits and pieces of a deeply intricate plan that was slowly coming to fruition. 
Basically, Abaddon wasn't trying to crush the Imperium with each and every crusade. In reality, he was only trying to do or get one specific thing and then leave. Mm. That's it. It was like a grab this and leave. It was just smoke and mirrors, basically. Everything was a distraction until Cadia. Until Cadia. You will hear this name a lot if you spend five minutes in Warhammer. This shifted the lore into a high gear that's still going to this day. For those of you that don't know, there's this planet called Cadia, and its location is deeply important because it is right at the Eye of Terror. Right, right, right there, right it next to it. It is right near the Eye of Terror. For those of you that don't know, the Eye of Terror, it's a hole into the warp, which is pure energy. Um, not all beings in the warp are demonic, but all demons come from the warp. And this Eye of Terror is one of the quickest ways in and out of it. Cadia, being the only roadblock on the actual highway to hell, <laughs> is absurdly militarized. I, I assume because it's right there. They're like, ah, this is the one planet we got as the first line of defense. Yep, their cities are built like mazes. Children's are trained and ready to use guns before they're done with their pacifiers. They get some of the best gear the Imperium has to offer is given to or made by Cadians. They are really freaking good. Yeah. They are really good at their jobs. They're big boy militarized and they're mm -hmm. ready to fight. As a whole, Cadia stood forever because its people have risen to the challenge every single time. That's just what they've done. Long story short, Abaddon invades Cadia. We assume to break this last fortress guarding the fastest way in and out. The planet fights back hard. You don't survive on Satan's front lawn without being tough. Yeah, they were tough to begin with. Mm -hmm. They were ready, kind of, for this challenge. Exactly, and they give Abaddon quite a bit of trouble. So to ensure victory, he takes this meteor-sized ship called a Blackstone Fortress and hurls it against Cadia. Just like crash land, just to... With the force of a small meteor breaking the planet. Oh, so we're talking like uh, the, the thing that killed the dinosaurs tier thing. That is exactly correct. Fun. Bigger. Bigger. Bigger, because the, the we'll, we'll get to what happened to the crust. There are three important things to know. Firstly, even though their planet was actually falling apart beneath them, this did not stop those still on the surface from putting up a fight. I assume this is where the uh, the, the quote, the planet broke before the guard did, came, came from? There was an evacuation, obviously. Obviously. You gotta get the civilians out. But not everyone made it off, and you could still see streaks of light from their guns firing to the very end. Which is why... The planet broke before the guard did. That's why that's a saying. As a crust was literally cracking around them and demons were approaching from every angle, these, and I cannot stress this enough, normal people... They're just, they're just guardsmen. ...fought to the bitter end. They're just guardsmen. They're putting, just guys. Putting duty above all. That is why Katie is held in such high regard. Basically, in an instant, a planet full of martyrs were created. Yeah. It, it, it was major. Second thing to note, those fortresses that Abaddon decided to chuck at Cadia, like Kyle punching through a brick wall, are really rare. They are So he took he took an L on that, is what you're saying. At, at the, least a little bit at of At the one. time of recording, there are ten accounted for total. Which goes to show how important breaking Cadia was for him, because he sacrificed effectively an irreplaceable superweapon. Just to break it down. Yeah, that's a that's a big deal. And thirdly, apparently one of Abaddon's side projects were destroying these things called pylons. They were basically holding back the Eye of Terror. He was disguising these in the failed crusades. He'd always destroy the pylon, get whatever he wanted, and then dip out. Well, since one of them has been destroyed, would you say that we must construct additional ones? I would say so. Yes. Because Cadia was the last one of those pylons. Oh, and as it broke, laughter rang out across the stars. Whose laughter, I might ask? Because not only was the Eye of Terror unguarded now that Cadia has fallen, but this hole into another dimension began expanding. First eating what was left of Cadia in its entirety, before ripping through the rest of the galaxy, tearing it in half. We love to see it. 
with demons of all kinds not seen in ages making one full pun intended hell of a comeback warp storms are now ravaging the universe and everything that's even remotely psychic got a massive buff from this fun all because one guy decided he wanted to rip the new universe a literal new one exactly i'm, I'm not exaggerating when i say this is the single most era defining thing happening right now abaddon has split the imperium in half led to countless deaths and could be blamed as the cause for the entire state of the universe right now tell me where you've heard that one before oh i see you see starting to fill those shoes but he's the, getting there but the fun doesn't stop there the fun doesn't stop there no, at no, 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 ripping no. the universe a literal new one and splitting the galaxy in half one half of the universe has been plunged into darkness period Imagine if you were in charge of Earth and suddenly one hemisphere just went silent. I think I'd be a bit scared. That's Gilliman's plight. For those of you that don't know, Gilliman is a Primarch. Think of them as demigods with dominion over one thing. His dominion is taxes. They are big guys. I'm joking. It's organization and regimenting. But it's easy to see why he's in charge. I mean, that involves taxes. So by technicality... He's the god of taxes. He is the god of taxes. But before he could even begin to figure out what the hell was going on with one half of the Imperium going dead silent, Korn, 40k's god of war and relatively angry fellow, not being one to sit around on his thumbs, decided to mark his place as the strongest of chaos gods and spat an entire army on Earth. Just direct... Direct onto Earth? Right where the Emperor is stuck in his chair watching his favorite soap operas. <laughs> this is why I love Korn. He is always working. He's, he's he a go-getter. He, he grinds. Didn't, he didn't take five minutes to appreciate the victory at Katie. He was a cool invasion. Keep going. Keep going. He grinds bones <laughs> to dust. They managed to repel it without getting any... Well... A lot of bones were ground to dust, but not the big, important set of bones on the throne. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that they, they took quite a few casualties, even by 40k standards, um, and this had not happened since the heresy. Earth had not been invaded since. This shook the entire Imperium, because at the time, the thought was, Earth's unassailable. It's fine. The, it's fine. We don't the, need to worry about this Earth. This is where the god emperor sits with his best guards. If anything, There's no way it's getting invaded. Nobody would be that stupid. It, it's completely unassailable. And Korn ran amok on it. And that's just the beginning of their problems. <laughs> that's just the beginning? This is like five minutes after Katie fell, effectively. Five minutes after Katie fell. It's, it's Warhammer. It's, it's Warhammer, so it's not five minutes, but it's five minutes. But it's five minutes. They could not have reacted fast enough for this. Yeah. This is a good time to mention that a good chunk of the Imperium does not know that chaos even exists. Doesn't know that chaos exists? Nope. Back in the day, it was on a need-to-know basis, with the consequences of knowing without needing to being death. Oh. It's a fun thing. That's the, a very fun thing. The theory at the time was if people are aware of chaos, it might give them worship, which is just wrong because they still get worship inadvertently, but that was the leading theory, which is why most of the Imperium is kept in the dark about chaos. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, you know how you can see the arm of the Milky Way when it's a good night and there's not much light pollution? There's no, no clouds out, yeah. Exactly. Imagine if you could see that day or night and it was howling with the voices of the damned. I exaggerate a bit. It's still pretty bad. I. It's still pretty bad. It's impossible to keep chaos a secret nowadays because your average Joe just needs to look up for confirmation. That's frightening. And it's for some planets, it's a line distant in the sky. For some planets, my sky's red now. <laughs> I'm in this. Because <laughs> the line just kept going through. It didn't warp around planets. It went through them if it needed to. <laughs> and then some planets just suddenly turned into Kylid. <laughs> exactly. Witnessing this scar happen immediately caused more chaos cults to pop up than you could count. Immediately. Yeah. I don't have enough fingers. <laughs> In an attempt to put out all the fires, Gilliman calls for major changes. And because things are so tough right now, everything's so unstable, for once, the Imperium, which is bogged down by bureaucracy, can actually change. Only because if they don't, they will actually die. 
Yeah. So Gilliman calls for a huge, massive crusade, which he t- he dubs the Indomitus Crusade. Hence the name, Era, Era Indomitus. Indomitus. It's a force unlike anything that has been assembled in millennia. With him so desperate, he starts changing space marines with the help of the mech, uh, the mech boys and pumping them out at an unheard of rate. Changing space marines? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. There's new. There's new. They're called change. Primaris marines. They have mm. extra. They have extra um, organs relative to regular space marines, and they're just kind of better. Not everyone likes space marines because it feels like space marines, space marines. Mm. But it also kind of works because of the, the life and times of what's going on right now. Suffice to say, it's kind of heretical in 40k to change space marines because it's kind of seen as the emperor's work. Yeah. So who are you to change the emperor's work? Yeah, because all of, if I remember correctly, all of the organs that baseline space marines are given are just like, these are organs that are gifts from the emperor himself. That's, that's how they see it, right? And so like adding more, I would figure... But again, this things, was his intention. But, but his with a capital H. But but his with a capital H. But with everything going on, he gets a, he gets rubber stamped. It's it's, approved. it's it's either change or die. Exactly. He also frees the custodies to go to the front lines. These guys are beyond space marines. Yeah, they are. They are bigger. They are faster. They are stronger. They're functionally immortal. And they have a perfect memory. And they have insane drip. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gold. Gold head to toe. They have stood guard over Earth since the... Uh, hold on. They've stood guard over Earth and the Emperor since he got put in his wheelchair. It's on wheels? Uh, he wishes. Why doesn't he take it to the beach then? Have he, a vacation. He wishes. Uh, some have been as still as statues for centuries, but still able to slice a fly in half if it got too close. <laughs> Yeah. We're talking the British Royal Guard on steroids. And by steroids, I mean a lot of steroids. They are a lot. They're better than Space Marines in almost every way. And each one is borderline handcrafted. Because of that, there's not that many of them. They use de facto the best weapons the Imperium has to offer and eternal training. You can't have too many custodies. They're very rare, which is why they never left Earth. But things are so desperate now that we they're need being them. sent out. Custodies are always outnumbered, but they're never outmatched. Them being out there is massive. And it's still not enough. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, what more? Gilliman's crusade barely arrives on time to save the Blood Angels from the Tyranids, which we cover in one of our episodes on Patreon. And while all this was happening, the universe didn't just stop either. They didn't wait for Gilliman to float on over there and save the Blood Angels. Nurgle, who's the god of rotten decay, he's really nice. He's just gross. He's really nice. He's just, he's just so gross. He just wants to give you some sweet gifts. Exactly. It just happens to be that those sweet gifts botulism. Are, are the bubonic plague mixed with botulism, AIDS, cancer, and... And a little bit of syphilis. Exactly. He and did, it spreads through the air. He does not want to be outdone by corn, um, so he got off his slovenly butt and waged a plague war all over Gilliman's backyard. <laughs> One, two, three, four. I declare it plague war. E- exactly, which adds even more to the avenging bean counter's plate. <sighs> world after world is dealing with the worst diseases and rot that Nurgle has ever made. And even though Gilliman managed to chase him off his property, it was not without great cost. Yeah. With him being outright killed by his brother Mortarian. He's another Primarch, serving chaos, specifically Nurgle. He's got such good art. Such good art. He looks so good. Do his yourself model, a favor. His art. Do yourself a favor and look at Mortarian's art. It's so good. I, for one, cannot stand Nurgle's aesthetic, not because I think it's bad, it's just, it's done so good, it grosses me out, and I've said this before, mm-hmm. but Mortarian's model is so good enough that, like, I, I have to. It's so I will cool. put myself through the hell and the, the, uh, of looking at <laughs> Nurgle's aesthetic mm-hmm. to see Mortarian's art. It's that good. Yes, and Mort- and this is, this is really important about this fight, you need to understand this. Gilliman's not in stasis. He's not saved in the nick of time. Gilliman is dead. He dies. Flatlined on the floor. And we'll pick up on the consequences of that after our foreign fracas. Or international incident. It's a working title. It's a full full title, title. I guess. Moral of the story is, 
In one of our original episodes, I shouted out the Australians for being the most active in the comments and view time. Since the machine overlords get to give me those stats, it's fun. Um, since then, it's been a complete trend for you guys to let me know where you're from and fun facts about the drive dirt you call home. I love that because I love travel in all its forms. So that I'm a huge fan of this and I'm a huge fan of learning more and more about various countries. There can be only one winner though. And while it was close with Brazil and the U.S. neck and neck, the Netherlands snuck in with a victory this week. <laughs> so congrats to the Netherlands. Uh, their fun fact is, did you know that one of their military strategies, should they get invaded, is tactical flooding? Tactical flooding? Tactical flooding. They're pulling the, the one strategy from that one episode of Avatar The Last Airbender? The episode where they have that the... one episode. Do you know how little that narrows it down? There's not a lot. There are four books, each with thirty episodes, I believe. It's the episode where um, I think it's in the middle of the Earth Kingdom. Um, there's like a bunch of like rebel kiddos, and they see like a Fire Nation base, and there's like downstream from a dam, and so they plan to blow up the dam and then. Oh, kill all the fire nation guys yeah not realizing that just a mile further down from the fire nation camp is an earth kingdom village i remember that episode that episode jet god jet. that character did not that character did not deserve the ending he got that was brutal i can't remember it was anything. dark he, uh he got brainwashed and kidnapped by the earth bending cia oh yeah yeah uh, that there is no war in bossing say which by the way those finger gauntlets that they can shoot out as bullets so those so cool so cool. i remember being a kid and i fantasized about earth bending just so i could have those dumb finger oh, you, gauntlets. you best believe every shower i was trying to water bend it was gonna happen <laughs> who, who it was gonna happen who wasn't I, I was sat at the stove like come on Come on! I was more of an earthbender kid. Like I, that, that has consistently been my favorite of all four, and I will die on that hill because I know some people say earthbending's dumb. You're not just wrong. You're stupid. Now wait just a minute. And you're ugly, just like your mom. I was, I was like out there like a weirdo kid on the playground, stomping the ground, hoping that I could get a rock to come up. Oh, dude, kid me would have been struck by lightning if it told me it would give me firebending. I, I was desperate for it i remember um i had a vr kit for a little bit and one of my favorite games to play on it was um blade and sorcery not for the blade and sorcery but for the mods one of them was an earthbending mod that is really well done oh, and it was fun I'm, i got to live out kidney's dreams i'm glad you enjoyed it the netherlands gets to enjoy theirs too the flooding yeah the tactical flooding apparently it's because it's a very low-laying country, and flooding is an issue they've already had to deal with. So in times of need, as a kind of like, if I can't have this, nobody will, they can just flood oh, just areas. Flood areas. And lay out purpose-built traps in the newfound water. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Tactical flooding. It also helps that on average, they harbor the tallest men on planet Earth at an average of 6'1". An average of six one. The average the is six one. Average guy is six one. Yeah. I. So while fitting, I am that height, and where I live, that's like slightly above average. So I don't tower over people, but like I'm still like you having. Tower, you tower over most people. I have to look down at most people, but not like I, down too much. I have to look much. down at most people, and I'm not that tall. So like for that to be the average. Yeah, that's the average. For that to be the average. Jesus. Exactly. So a little bit of water shouldn't be a problem. However, fitting into a compact car just might be. Yeah. Yeah. That'd do it to them. As always. They'd hit every speed bump and just clunk. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And some cars are just not meant for tall people. I'm tall-ish, and I've, I've gotten to sit in some sports cars, and I've had to eject myself out. Every single time. I don't mean like leave gracefully. Oh God, when I'm in there, it's so much fun. The amount of times I've so hit my fun. head on the like the 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 door frame of certain cars. Mm -hmm. Somehow I've hit my head on the door frame of a Toyota Sequoia. I don't know how I accomplished that. It okay, that's happened. Just on you. That's that's just on you. That's a huge. For those of you that don't know, that is a full size SUV outside the U.S. I know these are fairly rare because most countries have smaller roads. Most countries, big cars just aren't that popular. They do exist. Yeah, but they're just not as popular as they are here. You can't fathom how big our SUVs get. Yeah, they're huge. You can't 
fathom it. If you like, if you were to take a a a full size SUV from the U.S. and try and drive it through English roads, oh boy, you would hit the sides of buildings. Oh boy, I remember one of my fa- one of my favorite studies about the large SUV- SUVs is that that it's becoming a visibility problem, like a significant visibility problem. Like there was one study done uh, where they just had like kids sit in front of an SUV until the driver could see the top of one of their heads, and they got out to like twelve or eleven kids before the driver could see just, just the tiniest fraction of the top of one kid's head. That's one hell of a skill chain. <laughs> now, anyway, thank you guys Jesus. for always commenting and leaving your fun facts. Now, let's get back to Gilliman's second death, or as I like to call it, a tax cut. <laughs> back to the thick of it. He is laid out by his brother with an assist from Nurgle, which is a great time to point something out that I need you to keep in mind for the rest of this episode. The warp is not inherently evil. Like I said, all demons come from the warp, that's true, but not everything in the warp is bad per se. There's just a lot of evil in there. Well, this massive crack ripped through the universe, chaos got a huge buff, obviously, but so did everything remotely connected to the warp, including our favorite quadriplegic, who desperately needs some moisturizer. (laughs) The Emperor of Mankind. And when Morty pulls Gilliman into Nurgle's backyard to finish the job, Gilliman's body begins to float up and is stricken by a pillar of light. <laughs> he literally does the, I must go, I I must save my people, and then... Exactly. His face stops sloughing off. I told you Nurgle was gross. Sloughing off? This was... It, the, the disease he was injected with is called God Blight. God Blight. Yeah, it was designed for this. It was rotting his armor. It was rusting away. Jesus. Yeah, for a normal person, you'd probably be dead on the floor. Yeah, you'd Um, be dead in seconds. But but as he floats up, his armor stops rotting away as does the rest of him, mending itself before Morty's very eyes. And this is very important. Morty. (laughs) And this is very important. Morty is frozen in place with fear. Just like, what the, what's going on? What's going on? No, no, no. Whatever it was that was doing this felt like Nurgle, but against him. Mm. And then it spoke, not with Gilliman's voice, but something else, calling Morty a traitor that destroyed everything, but importantly, telling him he could be saved before something else yanked him away to explain his failure to Nurgle. At this point, Gilman sprouts flaming golden wings and proceeds to burn Nurgle's garden to the ground, declaring that even the realms of chaos are nothing but dreams in the face of the only real thing, will. And there is one will above all others. <laughs> yeah! Damn. Yeah, the Emperor has not done anything that direct for a while and even to Gilliman it was a lot I assume Gilliman has had some issues with that since being possessed by Papa would not be a he actually went to him for advice because of everything going on Gilliman knows his limits sometimes eventually he'll figure it out and when all of this happened and the Imperium was torn in half he immediately just went to dad and was like uh, I need help uh, Help. what do I do help please please Help. He described it as a psychic sandblasting. <laughs> and he's a Primarch. He's effectively a demigod. And he was not happy after that chat. No, that's what I mean. Mm-hmm. It's like, it, it's a lot. It's a yeah. lot for somebody who's like basically a demigod to take. Mm-hmm. A normal guy, they just their body wouldn't handle exactly. the psychic blast. They Ex- just <laughs> disintegrate. Yeah. The Emperor is so amped up from millennia of sacrifice worship and that big crack in the sky that when he speaks it's like a thousand voices all fractured all in sync and all out of sync agreeing with each other contradicting each other at maximum volume i'm fairly certain a regular person would go mad 
if he so much as said hi. Instantaneously. Instantaneously. Instantaneously, they'd be just disintegrated. But it's a big deal that the emperor is 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 that awake. He's he's active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not all bad. That is the current state of the Imperium, split in half and doing the one thing they know how to do when they're backed into a corner. Crusade. Crusade. And they're doing they're having a hell of a time. We'll get back to them. Now we need to zoom out for a bit and move on to the rest of the universe. Because I, I didn't want to make this just an Imperium video. We'll get back to there them. There are other things happening than just the Imperium. Exactly. And this way it makes more sense because we're going to get to these guys. And then this is going to tie into Arcs of Omen, which is going to get us back to the Imperium. And most importantly, the geese are waking up the lion. Which is a, a big deal. A big deal. A day um, in the life in an Imperium geezer. Oh, God. Rev up the... <laughs> <laughs> Rev up the rocket bike. Oh, God. Whee. Let's start with the robots. The Necrons are starting... The Bone Boys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We covered a lot of this in our Necron video. Link somewhere. Um, And they're starting to flex their might. More and more of them are waking up left, right, and center. Apparently, the big crack opening in the sky also served as a kind of alarm for a lot of them. So more of them are waking up than ever. They're like, uh-oh, we've seen this before. Yeah, more of them are waking up than ever, and um, the Silent King, that's the big Necron head honcho, is conquering world after world after world, expanding the space that he controls, actually rebuilding a full-blown empire. This must be terrible for the Imperium. Kind of. He chooses to mark its borders with something called the Pariah Nexus. The Pariah Nexus? I told you, there's a lot to research for this video. The Pariah Nexus is... What it does is it cuts off the space that it is in and they occupy from the warp completely. Mm. So you think that would be amazing. Finally, something to deal with the massive swath of chaos causing pure shenanigans. The galaxy, yeah, yeah, exactly. But no. No. See, this zone doesn't rein in the warp. It silences it. The reason it's called the Pariah Nexus is it's named after this gene that can happen in people called the Pariah Gene. It comes in Sisters of Silence, and they do the same thing of suppressing the warp very heavily. People, they they usually don't live very long because it's so icky to be around them. Mm. It, it, you feel nauseous, you feel unpleasant, you feel lethargic. Imagine if somebody covered your immortal soul with a wet blanket. Yeah. Those I think it, it mentioned in the, the, the Necron video is when they got turned into the Robo Bone Boys, it slurped their soul out and so they instantly, it's the same thing basically, right? No, no. It just, it just really heavily suppresses the warp in that area. Oh, so they don't lose connection to their soul. They're just mm-hmm. like... It's not unique to them. Some other things do it. Like I said, some people can be born of that gene. They don't make it to adulthood usually because they'll like pop out and everyone in the room will go, what? What is that? What are you? What is that? Why are you doing this to me? They will not make it that far. But if they do, they usually get like a pretty swanky gig being like an anti-psyker unit from the Imperium. So it's not uncommon for this to happen. But what is uncommon is the fact that they can build a zone to do this. Nobody else can build like an area of no war. Yeah, usually people are born with it. They yeah. don't artificially. And there's other ways other races do it. So the, the scary thing about the Necrons is if they take over the whole galaxy, they can blanket it in this nexus, which is what the Silent King wants. Yeah. Effectively shutting chaos up. But the Emperor is inextricably linked to the warp now. So he can't, he doesn't really have that option. So if they ever get to Earth, they may be able to outright kill him. And God knows what this would do to a Primarch, because they're also inextricably linked to the warp. They were made with energy stolen from the warp. It'd be a big problem. It would be a big problem, which is why right now the Imperium is constantly fighting at their borders, trying to contain this nexus. Yeah, just like, hey guys, Mm -hmm. please, please. I mean, shut up the warp in your area, but like, we are, our souls though, Mm -hmm. we still have ours. We still have ours. (laughs) So like... You know how it feels to not have one. You know what? We wouldn't want to lose hard. Please, please. No more of this whole blocking out thing. Ex- we don't need to hit the mute button. Let's just turn the volume down. Exactly. And there's all kinds of other shenanigans happening with them. The Necrons right now are poised to do a lot, but they don't have as much meat on that bone yet. Like Trazen. Well, they don't have a lot of meat on their bones anymore. Oh, boy. <laughs> 
Trazen, everyone's favorite kleptomaniac, is currently in the warp doing something. A lot of the Necrons are currently doing something. Mm. We're not sure what, but it's all... There's a lot of major pieces moving about when it comes to the Necrons. And they're, if left unchecked, could be the biggest problem in the galaxy. But right now, there's a bigger problem that really doesn't like the Necrons. It really doesn't like the Necrons? And it's the Tyranids. The Tyranids? They're Bear Grylls as a hive mind. They're Bear Grylls as a... They'll adapt to any situation and eat anything that isn't nailed down. They're currently facing the problem of having to eat faster now because a lot of their food is literally being sucked into hell. I, if my, if my, if my mm-hmm. l- lovely, my lovely sushi dinner was being sucked into hell you'd be eating quicker i'd be eating quicker exactly exactly and that's the problem I'd try to out eat hell exactly and that's I'd probably lose the chopsticks though by accident <laughs> and that's the problem they face while the necrons are a big problem the tyranids are the biggest the biggest problem, problem. they are evolution without constraint able to adapt to any and everything which If somehow that doesn't sound scary enough at the beginning, let me give you a sense of scale. Up until recently, the main plan to deal with Tyranid Hives was to bait them into a long-standing war with the Orcs. The other major threat in the galaxy. And just let them go. The bugs evolve through combat. The Orcs get stronger by fighting. It's a terrible evil to match them together. But it had to be done. Because extinction was the only other option. They were both unstoppable tides, and the only way to deal with them was to have them crash into each other and hope that they're locked in eternal conflict, or they, like, off each other. Yeah. The worst case scenario is one of them wins and leaves. Which Much stronger. Very, very bad. It was literally said, whoever wins the war in that sector will win the galaxy. That was the wide... That was a wide-held belief. Yeah. Well, in the new... In the new era, we have a winner. We have a winner. And it's the bugs. Oh, God. It's the Tyranids. And now they're reaching out across the galaxy. That's not good. They That's didn't... not not good. Oh, it's so bad. That's very bad. And and they didn't care too much about chaos until the whole line. I told you, it's a very important thing. Everybody cares about that line right now. Yeah, it's a, big, it's a huge exactly. line. And in the time since that line happened, they have developed an entire high fleet purely to deal with chaos called high fleet chronos they are very good at what they do and they thrive on hunting demons they have a whole ecosystem built for them where one high fleet will go attack a world and strip it down and then chronos will go eat that because you can't eat the you can't eat demons they kind of like poof away when you get them yeah so there's no biomass for them to consume but the tyranids recognize well that's a problem so an entire hive fleet has been created just to deal with chaos very quickly by the way i mean i'd assume if anybody is going to be good at playing the whack-a-mole game with the chaos demons (laughs) it would be the tyranids because they seem very effective exactly it was long believed that tyranids were coming from the nearby galaxy since every fleet seemed to come from the same ish direction like they didn't all come from one place but like you know it was all coming from the right let's say. It was comforting in a way because we knew where to expect them. But in the modern day, a new tendril of Leviathan has come in from the exact opposite direction. Gilliman's entire Indomitus Crusade is on one end of the galaxy. Another tendril of Leviathan has come in from behind. Which raises the very real fear and possibility that the galaxy as we know it is surrounded that's frightening. And that's not even the worst bit. That's not the worst bit? The fleets we've been fighting up until recently have been theorized to be scouting fleets. We're not sure if this is the full might of the Tyranids. Ooh. And now they're coming in from new directions, meaning it could not be from one side. It could be from all. Ooh. Another frightening possibility is the Tyranids are leaving their galaxy, not because it's empty and they've eaten everything there, but because they're running from something worse. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so we thought they were the flood from Halo, but they might just be the humans evading the flood from Halo. Exactly. Gilliman has a massive problem right now, as seen in all the trailers, because his forces are in one place, the Tyranids are in another. 
and that place cannot fall. So in an attempt to try and deal with this new tendril, he's forced to throw very small elite squads that can travel faster than an entire crusade to prevent it. So he's throwing very, very elite squadrons of veterans against these Tyranids. He's, he's forced to do guerrilla warfare in his own Imperium. Exactly. And the problem is these are their best trained warriors. And if you see any of the new trailers, they're beach softeners. Yeah. They are being treated like cannon fodder before the new Tyranids. They're being torn apart by doll like dolls by the Tyranids. And the best thing about the Tyranids is whenever a hive fleet is in an area, they cast this shadow in the warp. I told you. The Necrons aren't the only ones who can suppress the warp. Just a Tyranid high fleet being near you does the same thing. The Tyranids are blanks too? Not quite blanks. Uh, we're not sure how they do it yet, or at least I'm not sure how they do it yet. Um, but it, they, effectively, they cast a shadow in the warp. It's not an intentional thing from what we know. But the effect it has is, if the Tyranids have attacked you, nobody can hear you scream. Hmm. Yep. That's frightening. They're gearing up to be the big bads, and I really hope I'm 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 so frightened it's gonna be Imperium versus Bugs. Because it's not looking good for the Imperium. No, 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 no. It's just things get reduced to like Imperium versus X or Imperium versus Y. I would love for the Tyranids to get so big that everyone needs to go. Whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have like a Mass whoa. Effect situation of everybody in the galaxy is like, mm-hmm. oh god, 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 we got that's a bigger problem. We let's get over our differences quickly. Or or new deals have to be struck where the maybe maybe the Necrons have to deal with them because you know you can't need a machine. <laughs> and they'll oh, probably great. try oh great you silenced the warp around me i do the same thing <laughs> okay we double silenced it we double silenced it rock meat paper <laughs> like so I-, I hope that's the route they go i'm terrified it's going to be imperium versus tyranids either way it's cool to see the new models it really is <laughs> i have seen the new tyranid that's models so they look real good so Real good. Um, and that is the current state for the Imperium, kind of. Halfway through the current state of the Imperium. The Necrons and the Tyranids. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Make sure you tune in next week where we cover the remaining factions. Um, there's a lot happening in the current setting. And it would have been impossible to fit it all into one video. So this will be a multi-parter. Once we wrap that up, we'll take a small break from 40k and feed that one's Dune Addiction. Because <gasps> the new trailer just dropped. Ah. But we will be back. Please keep leaving the factions you want to see covered in the comments. I see you Salamander fans. I see you Tau fans. I really see you Night Lord fans. I'm curious about the Tau. Please don't skin me. <laughs> I, I have seen I have seen the, the one guy who's just like day two until we get a Night Lord. I love him. There's, there's one guy who keeps <laughs> you commenting. You are not unheard. We do see you. We are listening to There's you. one guy who keeps commenting um their, their, their battle card, which is so cool. It's my favorite one. I I have to say this. It's Ave Dominus Knox. Okay, anything in Latin sounds cool. So, so cool. So, the Night Lords, we we see all of you keep commenting when we put together the next community poll. Some of those names may show up. Some of those names may show up. Represent your jars of dirt. Represent your favorite factions. We'll see what happens. Um, the names you've been seeing scroll by up until now are our awesome patrons. The list grows every day. Funnily enough, sometimes by the time it's uploaded, it's outdated. Yeah, no, no, I've literally had that problem. I've gotten in the habit of like uh, staying up as late as I can yeah, to I mean. watch the final like Patreon. Like, okay, it is literally 1 a.m. No one, unless you're insane, is subscribing to Patreon. We have multiple time zones. We're a global phenomenon. Come oh, on. God. Yeah. And then by the time the video goes up, it's out of date. Yep. The list is growing every day. If you want to join them and immediately get hotter just by clicking one link, that's a place to do it. That's a place to do it. You click it. It's like, you know when Squidward gets hit by the door and it becomes hotter and he gets hit by the door and it happens again? That's what happens. You click the Patreon link, bam, you get hotter. Doctors hate this one. Tr- plastic surgeons hate, <laughs> hate this, this one, one tr- trick. Exactly. Uh, not only will you get hotter, you'll get all kinds of fun perks and limited edition rewards only for those who make it on time. Like those who are going to get the 100 patch and those who are going to get the 250 patch 
as well as the 100 patch they already have. Um, so if you want to make it in, I'd recommend you do it quickly. Um, we tend to shatter goals very quickly here. Yeah. I love our Legion. We were surprised how quickly we shattered the 250. And without you guys, this isn't... I, I, I can't stress this enough. You guys are why we do this and how we're going to keep improving this for you. So we really appreciate you, and we will see you next week for more about Era Indomitus. And if you're on Patreon, we'll see you on Wednesday.